to the monk at the Japanese temple, so he might be very interested. He has an interesting talk about around that area. So Martin Hughes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's see if we can figure out how to work this thing out. Okay. I this for a while. What time being? Anyway, my name is Martin Hughes, and I'm going to be talking. Um, the theme that we presented is the history and development of Buddhism in Japan. That is the basic theme, and rather than boring you with minute details that you would soon forget, uh, I've decided actually in the same theme to focus more on the Japanese religious mind in general. And um, by that, uh, as I will hope to uh, explain in this first hour, the second hour will be open to question and answers. In this country, there are basically six different religions. Now, I will talk about each of them. Buddhism is the most, uh, is more like the umbrella religion over all of these. All of these exist in some form or another, but Buddhism is by far the most dominant of all of these religions. Now, these are not practiced, say, like uh, re religions in America or the West where one religion is living side by side or one sect is next to another but not really overlapping. These are all intermingled and sometimes very difficult to distinguish from each other. So rather than uh, say a religious mosaic, uh, it's more of a, actually a religious melting pot. It's sort of a religious stew, if you might. They, they uh, all mix together. And the nice thing about this is that there is very little conflict among these religions. There is very little conflict, and this is one reason why I like Japan uh, or the Japanese religious mind. And uh, so, each of these thing, these religions, they each fit a different need for the Japanese people. And for example, uh, one look at this folk religion, for example, is is hardly practiced, but they are not consciously practiced. Most of these religions you, well, that you see on this board, people do not say, I am a Taoist or I am a Confucianist. These are generally things that Japanese people feel unconsciously or they participate in unconsciously. They don't think that uh, the way we do in the West um, in that this is their own religion, and they are doing this consciously and uh, as a, apart from, say, other activities. Now, the first one, folk religions, this one is the weakest of all Japanese religions. And so there is nobody in Japan today that claims to be a member of any folk religion. Nobody is a member of a folk religion. However, the largest or the, the biggest ceremony of the year, or the biggest holiday of the year, it has its origins in Japanese folk religions, and that is the New Year's. Now, they do various uh, things. Um, they have, and that's on January 1st, and they have uh, several days for a holiday. Okay. Is this going to work? Okay. Thank you. So the best example is that of New Year's, and that is sort of like their Thanksgiving and Christmas mixed in to the same day. They take several days off, they clean the house, they start over. Uh, it's, a, it's our version of spring cleaning. It's a very they have a couple of days off from work, but it's a very difficult time for the Japanese because they thoroughly clean the house from top to bottom. It's January 1st, it's very cold. I do what I can to avoid uh, such activities. The next one is Taoism. That also has a, a very, probably has actually more influence on this culture. Taoism 
uh, came from China, of course. Uh, it's spelled with a T. Some people pronounce it Taoism, but generally it's Taoism. And uh, again, a very sublime yet pervasive influence. And it deals, um, what can I say, mostly with architecture, which way the building faces. Uh, there are certain, certain directions that uh, good or bad luck comes in and which side of the building do you put a pond on, which direction do you put your head when you sleep at night, uh, northeast, west, south, uh, each direction has its own special meaning, and so you've got architecture and you've got the calendar. Again, this is from Taoism, the ancient Japanese calendar. So for example, if you decide when you're getting married or when you're going to open a company or start a new business or anything like that, you consult with a traditional calendar and there are basically lucky and unlucky days so you, of course you don't get married on an unlucky day and also fortune telling very big business in Japan even more so than in the States again just a kind of horoscope and this is uh, again from Taoism and also you've got acupuncture and so on which are and herbal medicines things like that, which are greatly influenced by Taoism. And Taoism basically, as it is so-called, again, in Japan, nobody claims to be a Taoist, but it influences uh, daily life in this country. And it comes from China, and as it is practiced by a few people in China, it is, uh, I mean, nowadays, as it is practiced, it is a very superstitious, uh, religion, uh, sort of a nature worship, and with very bizarre um, beliefs, I guess one would say. One of the latest documentaries I've seen on NHK, which is uh, Japanese public broadcasting, about the Taoists living in Chinese mountains. They don't eat vegetables and they don't eat meat. They don't eat anything that might possibly give them gas. <laughs> because, and because uh, gas for them is expelling life force. That's a great way to shorten your lifespan. And so, uh, very bizarre superstitions by people that are sincere about Taoism. Now, of course, Taoism in the West is more, uh, as we understand it, more of a, a nature appreciation. Even that has... Uh, in many cases, um, at least Taoist literature is well known in the States for people who are familiar with poetry and so on. Even Henry David Thoreau uh, had his own commentaries and did some of his own translations uh, about Taoism. But again, uh, nobody in Japan, I've never met anybody in Japan that claims to be a Taoist. It's just sort of a a nature appreciation thing that now has really degenerated into a very superstitious um, uh, religion, if you can call it that, and one can barely call it a religion. The next is Confucianism. That also has a, a very profound effect on Japanese society, and the structure in this society, as well as Korea, which is even more pronounced, and in China, is it's a Confucian society. Now this can barely be perceived as a religion. It is basically a social structure and how government should be run and what is the ideal position and each family member's, uh, what can I say, role in the family and in society is determined by Confucianism. This is where originally was set up. Now that means basically that males have more uh, priority over females and the eldest son is the one in charge of taking over the family and carrying on the responsibility so he has more more responsibility and uh, status or respect than say the youngest son or any daughter and in turn the eldest daughter has more uh, status than say any younger daughters. The male is always the nominal head of the household, whether it's actually true or not, uh, is a case-by-case -case thing, but uh, as by Confucian, Confucianism 
no, I mean, nobody really, say, even reads these books anymore. However, the daily life of any Japanese structure is Confucianism. You won't find, uh, say, women as the head of companies or even executive members of the companies or very few vice presidents. Uh, this is because Confucianism is basically a male, feudalistic male-dominated society structure. And that continues, although that is eroding very quickly in Japan. Uh, I wouldn't say very quickly, but gradually, noticeably within the last 20 years. Uh, it is also still a very strong influence, even more so in Korea. And that is basically a, a feudalistic, uh, has its origins even before feudalism, but, but a sort of feudalistic mindset. And a lot of the dedication that the Japanese feel to their to their individual family members or their own company or their any organization they're involved in. This structure is basically Confucian. So, but again, in Japan, nobody claims to be a Confucius. And on another level, the and how it affects uh, uh, Asia in general is ancestor worship. Now, even Buddhism. And many of my duties, or many of the duties of any Buddhist priest in this country, uh, are are related around ancestor worship. An ancestor dies. Well, in the states, you know, you have your funeral, and and that's basically it. But in Japan, there are many memorial services that go on and on and on uh, for as long as 33 years after the person has died. And. That is basically an ancestor worship. For example, in uh, even though it's a Confucian uh, concept, typical priest in any Buddhist sect, ha at least half of his duties involve going around from house to house, doing a uh, about a 15-minute ceremony, usually chanting in front of the family altar, saying prayers for the deceased relatives. Now these folks are honored and they have their spirit, the spirit comes back to the, to the altar or to the family site. And also this, uh, for example, and maybe you've seen on television the, the Obon festival in August in Kyoto where they have the fires up in the mountainside with certain Chinese characters. The spirits come back and visit Japan or that area. And these fires are lit up to guide the spirits back. The next one is Shintoism. I'm glad to hear from some of you that you had a fellow speaking about Shintoism already. Probably managed to confuse you. Shintoism of all these is the most difficult to understand. I've been in Japan about 12 years now. I've read many books about Shintoism. I've had a chance on more than one occasion to speak to Shinto priests. And to this day, I barely know what Shintoism is. Very hard to define. And that's partly because it is not very well defined even among themselves. And I've asked Shinto priests to just simply define this religion for me, please. And in some cases, they've just said they cannot. Partly, it's a very nebulous, very nebulous religion, if we can call it a religion. And. One of the difficulties I think we may be having in understanding these, as we understand religion in the West, which is basically Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, dogma is very important. Now, dogma is not merely belief. It is not merely an opinion. Uh, dogma is generally a, a doctrine or body of doctrines formally and authoritatively affirmed. That's according to Webster's. So you've got a religious body that is authoritatively affirming a certain set of beliefs. Well, we can understand that in Christianity we have that, or in Judaism, or in Islam. But in any of these religions here, except for Christianity, but even Japanese Christianity is a very light version. There is no single body that pushes dogma. Of course, in, say, folk religions, there is no official body at all that remains. There probably never was, except for uh, ancient shaman that existed before, basically before civilization developed. 
Taoism never really had, except for maybe the uh, founders way back in China who wrote the most famous books, um, which are basically almost just poetry books, actually, nature worship. Hardly anything dogmatic about that. And Confucianism, well, Confucius wrote several books on social structures and things like that, but there is nobody that there is no body that affirms any kind of dogma, and there really is no dogma. What Confucius did was he developed a pattern, a social structure for for a, a model for people to follow if they wanted to. That is what Confucius designed. Shintoism, they really, I can say, they almost have no dogma. It is, uh, has been nicknamed the, the religion of 10,000 gods, a uh, very animistic religion. Gods, in this sense, is uh, synonymous with spirits. Now, what that means is that you've got mountain gods, you've got gods for any animate object, uh, particularly trees that are that uh, older trees, uh, objects that have been around for a while, obviously in the mountains, they, they seem to acquire a spirit over time. This is why an older tree has a spirit. Now, in my particular case, I found that out more when I began pruning trees in my own temple. Some of the neighbors were a little bit upset, and they told me that bad things would happen to me. And I basically I told them I wasn't afraid. And uh, no, I did some serious pruning of some trees that were very, very old. And that upset some of the extended neighbors, not the immediate neighbors, because the immediate neighbors were raking the leaves as almost as much as I was. And they were in danger of having their houses crushed by falling limbs, as I was. This is why I more than pruned some of these trees, shall I say. Uh, but this upset a lot of the neighbors, extended neighbors, not the neighbors that were sweeping the leaves every day. And that's because people believe that these trees acquire a spirit and they were afraid that I might kill some of the trees and so on. And even the act of pruning these trees was perhaps incurring the wrath of the spirit of these trees. Of course, none of us here believe that, but the Japanese do. That is a Shinto, Shinto, basically, basically a Shinto concept. And also for wells, I mean, if you fill a well, particularly if the well has been there for a while, nobody is going to fill a well nowadays because they're afraid the spirit of the well will come back and, and haunt you or do evil things to you. And recently, about two weeks ago, we had some earthquakes, again, getting back to the spirit of trees. And there was a very large tree in a temple that went down not far from my temple and uh, went down on a house and they brought in three cranes to move it and there were six people working on that tree. The tree was probably three, four hundred years old and had been danger in danger of falling down for some time. I mean, it was at quite a slant. But of course, nobody would, uh, nobody could take any action to prevent this tree from crashing into the house. Of course, the house owners were wanting to prune the tree back for some time, but there was they had to get a permission or approval from everybody in the neighborhood. And of course, nobody would give approval, and nobody wanted to do it except the person whose house was in danger, and of course, the typhoon came along, and down the tree came. So they had all these people in, you know, it couldn't be helped, they had to move the tree. And, interestingly enough, during this process, a large snake appeared, scared the life out of everybody. So, of course, what they had to do was bring in the local Shinto priest uh, as soon as possible, in fact. All work stopped from that moment on, and he did his uh, purification ceremony, and then work proceeded. And none of these people would say, I am a Shinto believer, or I believe in Shinto. However, there you've got the uh, a modern day application. In fact, any building that goes up in Japan, even this building, before it was built, had its own Shinto purification ceremony, ground groundbreaking ceremony, I think it would be called, where they bring in, they have purifying salt and 
and water and sake and and do their ceremony. And also another aspect of Shintoism is the uh, how it relates to the emperor. Now the emperor basically has been absconded or hijacked several times in Japanese history by whatever military class. And the recent example was during the war. And this, in this case, the emperor was used for uh, as a justification for military action against other countries. Shintoism, in its purest form, believes that the Japanese are the pure race and the superior race. And of course, if you were taking over a country, including this country itself, uh, during the feudal ages or the middle ages in this country, there were many wars, almost an ongoing process. Uh, just in this country itself, well, the first thing you wanted to do was have the emperor on your side. And so, frequently he was controlled by whatever military class. In fact, this Nara itself used to be the ancient capital. And, and Kyoto has been alternatively the ancient capital. And this is where the emperor, at least if he did not reside in these capitals, why they were capitals, then he at least had his a major residence, and that was the the feudal government built there, justified themselves around him in many cases. And like I said, the most recent example was during the war, where the Tojo took advantage of, of Emperor Hirohito. And of course, you know, the ongoing conflict is whether the emperor uh, voluntarily participated or was coerced into participating. I don't know if anybody will ever know. And it depends on who you ask and what day it is and what's the latest book that came out. Probably he very much uh, was happily cooperated, as much as I can tell. And I am no historian, but the, I think the general opinion is that he happily cooperated. But that's not unusual. The next is Christianity. Now, only about 2% at the most, perhaps one and a half percent of Japanese consider themselves Christians. Only about one and a half percent of Japanese consider themselves as Christian. <coughs> but I think you would hardly recognize them as Christians. Maybe they go to church. Uh, I mean, the same can be said about Americans. I mean, we define ourselves as Christians, but do we go to church or not? It, the best way to define Christianity in Japan is that it is Christianity light. They, uh, of all of these religions that you see, Christianity is the most dogmatic, but they, Japanese Christians are not very, by nature, not dogmatic people. Therefore, they do very little proselytizing, almost none whatsoever. And probably very seldom do they read the Bible. They don't take it that literally. Literally, They are not, Japanese in general, are not attracted to dogma or black and, black and white interpretations of anything. Although Christianity has the most potential for that kind of interpretation, it does not fit that role here in this country. For example, even people that are Christians or define themselves as Christians, um, I think most American Christians would hardly recognize them as such. Many of the people that frequent my temple, although not, uh, we can talk about this later, but I don't really have a congregation. Most Buddhist temples do not really have a congregation. Many people that frequent my temple or come to seek me out, to make friends with me or to have conversations with, with me, these people frequently are Christians. And I know other Zen priests and even Zen masters that are Christians. Now these are separate, because it's Christianity with its black and white, fundamentally black and white interpretation and its own separate dogma, it doesn't mix as well with others, but there are, it's not that unusual to find Japanese priests, Zen priests, that are actually Christians, and the people that in the future will officially join my congregation when, um, so-called congregation, when I am allowed to start having one, these people 
thus far are Japanese Christians or would define themselves as Christians. And one of the reasons they are, are attracted to me is, well, maybe they like me. And also because I am able, I have some Christian background. For, in my case, for example, I spent three months in a Benedictine monastery. And of course, I was raised in America, therefore, uh, whether I like it or not, or accept it or reject it or not, I am by, by birth a Christian. I have that background. And this is, uh, so in terms of comparative religion, I can speak with them on subjects that are not available, uh, that, uh, that most people cannot talk about or not aware of. A typical Japanese priest is, knows very little about Christianity. A typical Japanese person knows very little about Christianity or Buddhism. And these people, another reason these Japanese Christians are attracted to me is in the future, if and when I develop a cemetery, they want to be buried in my temple. They want me to do their funerals. They want a Buddhist funeral, even though they are Christian. And for them, that equals a Japanese funeral. They don't distinguish so much as Buddhist and Christian. They want a traditional Japanese funeral, which is Buddhist. It's not Shinto, it's not folk, it's not Confucian, it's Buddhist. Buddhism basically deals with death in Japan. Memorial services, funerals, and so on. Christianity was introduced in in Japan in 1549. That was Catholicism by Saint Francis Xavier. And he was the first missionary to bring Christianity in. And not surprisingly, <coughs> immediately had problems with the local feudal government through his influence and his taking control over property. This is a problem that, uh, what, I suppose with lots of religions, but Christianity or Roman Catholicism, when they came in, they, I think they were fairly successful, at least enough to challenge the shogunate or the feudal, uh, feudalistic government, and with their acquisition of wealth of the Roman church and the acquisition of property, which seemed to be a habit of theirs, they were quickly thrown out. That was kind of a problem. And also, the Japanese were not used to this, uh, this kind of intrusion or religious invasion. And also, uh, Christianity or Catholicism, al almost by definition, is uh, well has a very powerful dogma. And that was a challenge. And that was one of the few religions that was immediately thrown out in this country. Of course, it came back several times and exists here today, but it is not very attractive to the Japanese in general because of its uh, dogmatic background. The Japanese are fundamentally repelled by strong opinions, which is why they've had problems absorbing Christianity. Now, when I'm talking about fundamentally they have problems with absorbing certain strong opinions, I don't just mean in the religious sense. You will very seldom find a Japanese person who will come out straight out and tell you exactly what they think. This just doesn't occur in this society. It's considered a rude thing to do, among other things. And they generally do not, say, cultivate their opinions. And if they do, they certainly don't share them. Religion is a potentially offensive subject, and so the Japanese in general do not discuss this. In general, they do, do not discuss such issues in public. Not so much out of shyness, it's just a very polite way of, of avoiding offense. In the West, we have sort of like the Socratic method, or whatever you want to call it, where we resolve things through conflict. This is not the way it's done in Asia, or in Japan, particularly in Japan. They're much too polite about that. In a way, it makes for a more cohesive society and so on, but very difficult to get a direct answer, if not impossible to get a direct answer from a Japanese person on anything that really matters. Nowadays, the uh, most of, in terms of how these religions overlap, in Christianity, for example, the most, if not at least many, 
if not most Japanese people, regardless of their sect, get married in churches or in, in cathedrals or chapels. That's the word I'm looking for. Most marriages or many marriages today take place in hotels. And the wedding gown is a very attractive piece of scenery for the Japanese, so they include that in the, in the wedding ceremony. They also do the Shinto rites as well, and sometimes the Buddhist. So you'll have basically two ceremonies, sometimes three, done in a hotel, very expensive operation. And uh, you have a Christian ceremony. That is done because it looks the best of all of them. This is why, like I said, regardless of sect, that is sort of like the, uh, of course the women decide which basically decide uh, which um, ceremonies they're going to go through, and the gown has always been very attractive, or recently, since the war, has been very attractive to Japanese brides or brides-to-be. So they all want to have their pictures taken in, in, in the white, yes, in the white wedding gown, so they do that. Frequently now, in a larger wedding, you will go through all three. You will go through the uh, the Christian and the Shinto and the Buddhist uh, receptions. Not so as much our ceremonies, I should say. Of course, there are many receptions. It's an all-day, very laborious, tiring affair, but the Japanese love their ceremonies. So it's not so much that these people are suddenly converted to Christianity, it's just that the Christian wedding ceremony looks the neatest of all of them. So, and just, and ge in general, the Almost without exception, when children are born, they go through the Shinto rites. And at certain ages, they go to the shrine and go through certain things. That is the domain of the Shinto. And when people get married, that's one can think of it basically as the domain of Christianity. When people die, that's the domain of temples, Buddhist temples of any sect. Very few people get mar uh, buried in Christian cemeteries in this country. Very few. I don't think, I've never seen a Buddhist, a Christian cemetery. Never. And even if these people are Christians, they generally want a Japanese funeral, which equals Buddhist funeral. That is the, most Japanese consider Buddhism as their, their fundamental or basic religion, uh, although historically it's actually been Shintoism. But Shintoism is so abstract that the typical Japanese person doesn't even really know what that is all about. But anyway, Christianity still has a major influence, not just in the wedding ceremony, but Western influence in general has been very strong in this country and is only increasing. And that is, well, you could say it's Western influence or Christian influence, but in fact, in Western society, Christianity and our Western civilization are almost indistinguishable. I don't think you could separate them. It would be very hard to do it. The last on this list is Buddhism. Now, Buddhism, in a way, I consider the umbrella religion or the umbrella thought of over all of these. Not so much that it is better, it's just that Buddhism has this structure that you have here with these six overlapping religions is in part due to the fact that Buddhism has very little dogma or hard dogma or very little emphasis on certain beliefs. This is why you can have six religions coexisting, overlapping, not merely coexisting, overlapping each other without, with almost no conflict whatsoever, let alone entry, any contradiction whatsoever. Because the Buddhist mind or the Buddhist thought gives very little emphasis to dogma. Now, the, when we think of dogma in Buddhism, immediately two things come to mind, reincarnation and karma. Karma is cosmic law. Uh, basically, if you do something good today, you will be rewarded in the future. If you do something bad today, you will suffer the consequences in the, fu in the future. Basically, what goes around comes around. Now, there are many different kinds of karma and actually many different kinds of reincarnation or many different interpretations, but uh, very, very fundamentally, 
people by their actions they are either reborn in a better light or reborn in a worse light lower on the scale I guess would one would say most Japanese people do not believe in either including the priests now back in terms of dogma in my own sect which is the Zen sect officially we had the Zen sect had to declare like all of the other sects we had to declare to the Ministry of Education exactly what our so-called beliefs are officially I believe all Buddhist sects have declared that they believe in reincarnation and karma but I have yet to meet any Japanese priest or master who will tell me yes I believe in karma or yes I believe in reincarnation in many cases they are not sure but uh, I think generally they don't believe in such things Japanese people also Buddhism in general has also been defined as a very rational decision uh, religion excuse me whereas karma or reincarnation although that was rational thought to people thousands of years ago and the history of re reincarnation it's been speculated or I've heard that it originated in Egypt where people saw that plants would die and that the same plant would regrow every year in the spring so rebirth very simple and perhaps that's where the, the roots of reincarnation come from perhaps not but most Japanese people generally do not believe in reincarnation and don't believe really in karma. Most of them really haven't even thought about it. Even when I ask them, uh, which I like to do uh, in many cases, uh, if you ask them if they believe in God, for example, for them that's an embarrassing question. It really puts them in a corner. Statistically, 95% of Japanese people do not believe in God. There is the only God in any of these, really, as we would define it, would be the Christian God. And that's not a very mean Christian God by any means. They have, a, like they said, that's back to Christianity light. Most of Japanese Christians, I don't know anyone that has ever mentioned, say, passages out of the Old Testament or anything like that. And probably, maybe 1% of Japanese Christians have actually read the Old Testament. So they don't really, they don't feel it's that important. And also these religions that people have, they usually they're born into them. It's not a conscious choice. Very few people are converted from one to another. If a person is Christian in this country or Buddhist, they are usually merely inheriting their family's religion. And really, I, I, I've known of people who drop out of their religion, but, or who expressed discontent, younger people, of course, wait till they get older, but, they, there's not really what we would call religious activity going on in this country, at least not on an active basis. It's largely ceremonial in all aspects, largely ceremonial. In Buddhism, for example, we don't have mass. We don't have Sunday sermons. I don't know temples that do that. Some occasionally in the Zen sect, we might have meditation periods. And say every Sunday or every Wednesday or a certain day of the week and maybe after that meditation period people will have conversations or ask basically a question and answer period with with the priest or the Zen master in charge but usually the questions are not all that profound in our sense of the word the Japanese fundamentally do not believe in afterlife that's another embarrassing question for them. This thing about asking them if they believe in God, it's rather like asking an adult if he believes in Santa Claus. You know, if I go up and very seriously and ask the typical American adult, in a, in a sincere tone, do you believe in Santa Claus? He's, first of all, he's going to be thinking, who is this guy? <laughs> and why is he asking me this strange question about Santa Claus? Well, this is the same with the Japanese. Their view of God is pretty much uh, similar to our view of Santa Claus. They, in this sense, they're very rational. Uh, they're not, they don't have much focus on, say, the next spiritual world or this spiritual world. So asking Japanese people about God is like asking New Americans about Santa Claus, adults, mind you. 
for uh, for the afterlife, that's a little less embarrassing for them. They usually just say, well, you die and that's it. They don't so much believe in, they also, if, if, if it's younger people, I mean, older people say in their 70s and so on will give, have given this a little more thought. Young people have usually been so busy trying to make their own living or getting through school that they haven't taken time to consider such things and most people are not very interested there really is no, say, Japanese equivalent to a young Christian movement or anything like that. I don't know of any such younger groups. Younger people are not interested in religion in general. And so, karma or reincarnation, most people do not believe in those, although those are fundamental Buddhist concepts. Other countries do believe in those. There are different, uh, Buddhism of course is a huge subject, bigger than any of these actually, older than Christianity. Buddhism in a way is like Judaism. Buddhism is 2,500 years old, has a very long and complex history. I don't know very much about Judaism, but I, my impression is that it's a scholarly, to really learn about Judaism really requires a scholarly effort. To, to understand that religion. Christianity, Catholicism, to really understand, Catholicism, I think, takes quite a bit of study. Protestant is not really necessary. For the Protestants, I believe, fundamentally, uh, the most important thing is not the scholastic study, but how you, your direct relationship with God. I hope I didn't offend anybody, any Protestants here, but that is my potentially volatile uh, description of Protestant. Whereas uh, it's more of a personal feeling. I don't believe Protestants deal so much with the Old Testament. Go ahead and throw your tomatoes if I'm wrong. But it is more of a a personal a personal interpretation of God directly through oneself and not through some other divine authority. Say like Catholics might refer through through the Roman authority and so on. Buddhism doesn't really have any central authority anywhere that big. Closest thing in the world would be the Dalai Lama, who, whose moral authority now is, I think, based upon just the fact that he's such a nice guy. I don't know that really that much about what he believes in. He does believe in reincarnation and karma, and that is Tibetan Buddhism, or Lamanism. And that is also a very that's outside of um, Japanese Buddhism in that they are still very grounded in their what other countries might refer to as superstitions and so on. I know I've had some contact with Tibetan Buddhists and they are very grounded in Tibetan folk religions or certain beliefs or concepts that have come directly out of Tibet. Japanese Buddhists on the other hand have a much more scientific or dispassionate or rational view of Buddhism. This is why, for example, they don't believe in reincarnation or karma. But the Dalai Lama is the closest thing to uh, a religious authority in Buddhism. Now, not other sects don't necessarily follow him, but I think uh, if anybody has has uh, seen or heard some of the Dalai Lama's speeches. At the very least, he's a very interesting man. Still, he does not speak for the entire Buddhist world. He is merely, uh, as the highest religious figure in all sects of Buddhism, although he is totally unrelated, I would say, to, to the group I am in or most other groups, he's still just a very respected figure, partly through the force of his own personality, not so much through his his office. The next Dalai Lama, whoever he may be, if he's not liked, well, that it's, uh, I think that, what can we say, he, nobody would listen to him, he wouldn't make the papers. So it's not so much that this current Dalai Lama has his authority grounded in his office alone, but it's his personal authority which he has cultivated outside of his own country. Inside of his own country, that office will always be their version of the emperor. That will always be the head of state, so long as they go by their traditional 
uh, government, which of course China is not allowing at the moment. Other aspects of Buddhism is that in Japanese Buddhism in specific, all of the sects, major sects of Buddhism that exist here have come directly from China through the Korean Peninsula. These sects did not, uh, Buddhism started two thousand, roughly 2,500 years ago in what is nowadays uh, northern India or Nepal. That was 2,500 years ago and Buddhism spread from there into China and other parts of Asia and from China it went through the Korean Peninsula and eventually came to Japan. Every one of the 13 major sects in practice today in Japan came directly through China. All of the roots of Japanese Buddhism sects are founded in China. Nowadays they have uh, newer religions in this country. Most of them are cults or business activities taking advantage of tax laws. Lots of cults. It's amazing. But usually they're just business ventures. Everybody recognizes them as business ventures. Uh, there's a little bit of they call them the new religions, in which case they frequently don't even have temples. And they meet in business halls, convention centers, and things like that. And uh, frequently you will see these groups in the newspapers for one of the latest financial scandals. They're very good at, well, at making the newspapers for conning people out of their money common activity, at least that one can see in the newspaper. Well, there are thousands of these new cults, usually based upon some new interpretation of Buddhism, and but I don't think most of them will not have any lasting effect, and probably 90% of them are merely business ventures. They're selling some new book or something like that. Great way to make a lot of money. Nothing particularly Japanese about that. But the 13 basic religions, any one of them uh, would be, would take a, at least an hour to explain. Most of that explanation you would probably forget. I know very little, actually I myself know very little about these other religions. I find them very interesting. Occasionally I will, will if I have a chance, go attend other meetings, even with other cults, not dressed as I am of course, usually in street clothes and a hat pair of jeans, tennis shoes, and uh, very interesting. With these newer cults, you can see more of a sort of dedication to something new. And like all cults, the, the members don't refer to themselves as cult members, and they are very enthusiastic about their new religion or their new way, and so on. But in fact, cults, uh, Christian cults, uh, perhaps are not so much difficult are different from Japanese cults in that sense. It's the basic cult pattern. Except for Japanese cults are a lot more passive, generally speaking, than Christian cults. I mean, it's very difficult to get arms in this country, although uh, Asahara Shoko with the, 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 let's see, I'm trying to remember, Supreme Truth Cult, I forget what they call him. Uh, the Om Shinrikyo in Japanese is the word, was quite a shock to the Japanese. That was a, a new experience for them. So they sort of gained the world stage for in cult activity through that. But otherwise, uh, as far as I know, there are no other cults that have amassed arms or, or that have pulled themselves up. In fact, even that, although Asahara Shoko was a cult member, he uh, it was very obvious from the very beginning that he was not really a religious activity. He has stated goal from the very beginning was to become the king of Japan. <laughs> oh, yeah, we can laugh. And that, you know, it's laughable. But uh, that was his intent, and of course later was, was to take over the world. But uh, hardly anything religious about that. So, let's see, how about we take a short break here and come back in five or ten minutes, and if you have any questions regarding anything, please ask. Yeah. 
Well, I've already had the first question proposed. Would you like to ask it again now? I just appreciate a brief synopsis. A brief synopsis or a brief description of Zen. If it were only that easy. Actually, it is very easy. And actually, I can get in a lot of trouble for. It's interesting, as I am the first American in this position, uh, I have to be very careful about what I say. One of my nicknames in this country is Kurofune Osho. That means Mr. Black Ship. Black Ship is the, is the name of the ships that, uh, or the color of the ships uh, that Commodore Perry, when he first came into this country and opened it up, frightened everybody. His ships were black. So they call me Mr. Black Ship Priest is my nickname. Basically, Zen, as differentiated from other sects of Buddhism, there are many different ways of dividing Buddhism. But in Japan, it is all modern Buddhism. Modern Buddhism versus, say, old Buddhism that is practiced in, say, Thailand, where you have the monks in the older robes. In that form of Buddhism, which is uh, Theravadan Buddhism or Hinayana Buddhism, is people are practicing for their own salvation or future enlightenment in which they are working through their rebirths until they are finally no longer reborn into this world again. In modern Buddhism, of which includes all of the Buddhist sects in Japan, it is a little larger than that, or quite a bit larger than that, in that we have the Bodhisattva concept. The Bodhisattva concept is the closest thing they have in this area of the world to a god. Now, Buddha is not really a god. He is merely the Christopher Columbus of their spiritual world. He discovered a new way of, of ending suffering. And he, Buddha initially claimed that the, the cycle of our rebirths can, can be ended in one lifetime when we eliminate all karma and break our chain of rebirth. With Japanese Buddhism, they have the concept of, and other sects of Buddhism, uh, they have this also in China and Korea, the concept of the Bodhisattva. The concept of the Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva means savior being. This is a being, initially a person, that has gone very high up on the reincarnation chain and is one step away from being a Buddha. A Buddha is an enlightened being that does not or is not reborn into this world that we live in. Uh, Bodhisattva is a being that has almost attained that state, yet will not cross over into becoming a Buddha in order to remain in this world to save the rest of us that are in our endless cycles of suffering and rebirth. Now, in Zen, we don't have, or we, there's very little, in Zen in particular, there is not much dialogue or conversation going on about or emphasis put upon any of these. Basically, these are abstract concepts. The purpose of Zen is basically, or can be described as the way of enlightenment, in which each individual person is responsible for his or her own enlightenment. The character for Zen, or the, the Chinese character that is, is used in Zen, means meditation. And this also came from China. It was pronounced Chan. And when people use the word Chan, they are referring to Chinese Zen. Zen is a Japanese word, a mispronunciation of the Chinese word Chan. And that basically means meditation. We are the meditation sect. If you go into a Japanese Zen monastery, the primary activity above all others is Zen meditation. We do some chanting and so on, but the emphasis is on meditation. And that basically 
they have certain training weeks called session or Oze session where in a typical monastery we will sit in meditation for 15 to 18 hours a day and that will go on for a week at a time and usually you have one of these very hard training weeks once a month and they are preceded and followed by a meditation week in which you only do five to ten hours of meditation a day and through this meditation we find our own enlightenment enlightenment of course is a whole other concept in which we require another description but in Zen we particularly in, in, in training in the Zen monasteries we do not study we do not sit around and read books we don't have time it's very basically a feudalistic model that was developed in the Middle Ages and continues to this day very faithfully it's a very difficult lifestyle very few people can do it even among the Japanese very difficult in fact I don't know how I did it I got two hours sleep a night that was hundred days at a time no vacation and I, I, was, I was the first foreigner in the history of that monastery, in fact, which had been around a thousand years, to, to graduate from that monastery. And one has to be very driven to do that, just to survive the hundred days. It's very interesting. I suppose the average person who is, say, curious about Zen or wants to attain some sort of oriental wisdom, this curious motivation might last three or four days and within a, <laughs> ten days the person would do like many people do which is climb over the temple walls in the middle of the night and disappear and even among the Japanese nowadays it's very difficult last year at a monastery near me, a Zen monastery near me of the four monks that attempted to to join the monastery there's a week long initiation training period initiation period and within the first month, let's say, I believe two of them couldn't get past the first week. These are young, healthy, 24-year-old, fresh college graduate, young, healthy men. Two of them couldn't get beyond the first week. And uh, within, within the first month, three out of those four were in the hospital. A very difficult, very difficult undertaking. Curiosity or the desire for wisdom will not carry you through. Anyway, yes, sir. I wonder if you might answer a question which you may have already touched on, but I'm probably guilty of insulting some of our Japanese hosts and friends by continually asking them, uh, is nirvana a state of mind or a place? Uh, I don't quite understand the okay. transmutation of souls. Is the spirit like a soul that, is, that, that goes through the cycle and comes back? What? There, there seem to be two things here, nirvana or enlightenment, and what is it a place, and also how is reality conceived? Okay. I 30 think seconds I'm, or less. Okay. <laughs> Are you timing me? <laughs> okay. Uh, first question is basically what is nirvana? For the Japanese, we, we don't really have that concept. There is that concept, but we don't use this word. Nirvana, the etymology of nirvana is no wind no wind and you that's what nil wind vain wind vain vana no wind that means that you go beyond rebirth and you become an enlightened buddha and you are not reborn and you extinguish your own existence that is the by western uh, by eastern standards that is the total enlightenment that is the end of the entire cycle the end of rebirth the end of desire the end of good and bad karma you graduated from this continual test of, of being reborn. For individual souls, transmigration of souls, each person historically in Buddhism, but not in Japanese Buddhism, although they have that, that teaching, people don't believe in it. Mostly people do not believe in it, particularly in the Zen sect. It's written in our Zen texts uh, that are submitted to the Ministry of Education that this is what our model of belief but I don't know anybody that believes in this. This means that you, in particular, or every person here, has a soul, and that soul continually goes through 
several processes until it cleanses itself of all desires or any sort of clinging. Desires basically are a form of clinging to existence. When we cleanse ourselves of this desire or which with its inevitable suffering, when we get beyond that, then we are no longer reborn. The soul is reborn because it still has some karma to resolve. That is the a synopsis of the classical definition of Buddhism. However, in the Japanese, the Japanese don't believe any of that. Uh, again, that's sort of a... But they seem to answer it in, in forms of uh, whatever it, the soul, it, it goes to a place where there's reward or punishment. Yes. Do they have that idea? They uh, have very... That's a nice thing about Buddhism is there's really no permanent hell. People can be punished uh, in the afterlife, but there's always a second chance. In this way, it's a much nicer religion, or much more user-friendly religion than, say, the Judeo-Christian thing where we have one chance here in, uh, here in this world, and if we blow it, then it's eternal damnation. And with, in Buddhism and in Hinduism, you are continually reborn, and eventually everybody works their way out of existence which would be a, um, their nirvana, which would be a state of bliss, one might say, or a state of true enlightenment. However, most Japanese do not believe in this. But they do believe in individual souls or spirits, and that spirit comes back, and this is why priests like myself do uh, memorial services. And this is why there are funerals and things like that. It's for the deceased soul. However, when you get beyond that, on a more abstract level, I think they just don't, they generally just don't think about it. They haven't really worked this out, how it really works. But they do believe that the soul keeps coming back. This is why they go and make offerings uh, to the family graves at certain times of the year, usually anniversaries of the person's death. Yes, sir? You uh, mentioned Islamic. Uh, yes. Brushed by it. Yes. If, if there's uh, some of the origin of the Japanese people is in Indonesia, a part of which is affected by Islam. Yes. I'm curious, is there any significant effect here? So the question is, any significant effect uh, from Islam on the Japanese people? I would say almost none whatsoever. It is the exact opposite in terms of religion, uh, according to to what the Japanese believe. Now, when we think of Islam, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the extremists and terrorism and things like that. In a way, a simple way of divining, de defining the, these three religions, they've got re um, Islam, Christianity and Judaism, and Buddhism. Islam, at least in the traditional um, fundamental our impression, at least from reading the newspapers, is a very volatile sect. And they, even in the ground level, uh, the non-fundamentalists, it's a very, very hard dogma that they have, and everything that was written in the Quran is true, and you better believe it or you're in trouble. And it is a very hard, in Indonesia, of course, it's a much softer form of Islam, but this kind of religious thinking is totally foreign to the Japanese. Christianity and Judaism is a little softer form of that. And on the other end of this, the exact opposite of Islam would be Buddhism, in which case the opinions don't really matter, dogma is almost irrelevant. The Japanese, in a sense, they have religious feelings, but they have almost no, generally speaking, they have very little religious opinion and or emphasis on beliefs. In my case, I, I would say I fit in the same category. I have very few of what would be recognized as beliefs, and I believe they are not very important. That is one of my principal beliefs, that my own beliefs are not very important. Well, you probably wouldn't hear that in an Islamic country. Uh, I have seen no real influence of any form of Islam on this culture whatsoever. I don't know a single Japanese person who believes in Islam. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, contemplation, going through uh, the ritual to become a Buddhist monk. What, what does one contemplate? 
<laughs> what it's not contemplating religion. You mean in the monastery? Yeah. What do we contemplate when we're meditating? Well, there are two sects, two active sects of Zen Buddhism today. In one sect, the Soto sect, they just contemplate their own breath. They don't have abstract thoughts, they don't think about Buddha or savior beings. They merely focus on their own breathing, which is a basic form of meditation anywhere. And through that, they believe they attain, they gradually attain enlightenment. The other sect that I'm involved in, which is the Rinzai sect, is we are given what is called koans. A koan is a question or a problem or a puzzle that is given to each monk. And these questions, these koans, have no rational answer. They are used more or less as a crowbar or a, or a device to break the intellect. The intellect, in this case, being defined as our definition of the world. And this sect, the one I'm involved in, is nicknamed the Sudden Enlightenment Sect. So they give you these questions that you cannot answer with your rational mind. For example, one that you, many of you may know is, what is the sound of one hand clapping? That is the kind of question they give you. And uh, when you're meditating, you think about that question or other questions. And several times during the day, you will go in and see the Zen master during a very brief interview period, very little conversation, usually one goes in and bows a few times and uh, faces the master who's right in front of you. There's just two of you alone in this private little room, rather intimidating experience. And first thing you say to him is the name of my koan is, and then you answer the koan, or you give the best answer you can think of, and then frequently he won't even talk to you. He has a little hand bell and he just rings it, which means very funny, please depart. Yeah. And uh, so there's not much of what you would call, in fact, there is almost nothing what could be defined as a teaching. He doesn't sit there and tell you, well, this is what I want you to think of Nirvana, or this is what the Buddha is, and uh, this is what we're thinking, and this is what I want you to agree with. None of that whatsoever. In fact, this first question usually takes three, minimum of three months, usually a year, two years, ten years to answer. And when one answers all of these questions, uh, there are about 1,700 in official use. First one is always the most difficult. Then you can, then you become eligible to receive uh, a license or certification to become a Zen master. So in our sect, in the Rinzai sect, we have these these little questions that uh, that are very confusing, to say the least, and it takes a long time to answer them properly. And also, answers cannot be given. Yes, do you have another question? Answers cannot be given. You're on the track there. Answers cannot be given. Who judges whether you've answered something? Pardon? How do you judge whether you've answered a question? Very good question. How do you judge if you've answered? Actually, uh, in most cases, especially with the first koan, when you get past the first koan, then, then, in a way, we can say that the first koan is Zen 101, or Buddhism 101. Until you pass that koan, at least in our sect, you really have no idea of what Zen is or what Buddhism is. Until then, when you understand it yourself, when you have your own breakthrough or your own self-realization or your own insight, then everything else is just talking. Everything else is just conversation. And until you have that, uh, then you cannot be, generally are not considered enlightened. So who is to judge? Well, the Zen master is the ultimately the judge. But before, particularly with that question, usually you know, well, you, of course, most people in our sect, which is the sudden enlightenment sect, you have a sudden insight and you know you know if you are right or not. He's merely like the referee or the final judge. He is the specialist, one might say. And other, as the first one is the most difficult, after that answers come much more quickly. But 
uh, you might have a correct answer, you might not, and it's not always so obvious. Generally, I found it very obvious. And usually, is there, is there a single answer or? Good question. Is there a single answer, for example, to the sound of one hand clapping? Well, there are many ways of expressing it, but yes, there is basically, and it boils down to, is there a Zen, is there a Zen insight? Uh, yes, there is. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, who organizes the public festivals and how are they? Who organizes public festival, festivals and how are they paid for? Uh, different groups organize them. Festivals can are frequently in the domain of the Shinto. Yeah. And they are neighborhood affairs on a smaller level. And I have, um, in my neighborhood, there are the, strictly the neighbors that get together and do that. In larger cities, like in Kyoto, where they have the very large festival, that is, I mean, the city government is never involved in that. They block off the streets. and. Of course, that requires cooperation on a very large scale. And people in, uh, in general pay for those. That's from religious donations. Shintoism, of course, is what is called a religious corporation. This is, uh, and they're tax-free. Their uh, you know, donations are not taxed. I also am not taxed because I am a religious corporation of one. Yes, I do in my neighborhood. Uh, sometimes they're fun. I at least have to make an appearance. I don't put on my robe. I just show up and, hi, how you doing? And people try to get me drunk as usual. And, and then I depart as fast as possible in many cases. Some of them can be a lot of fun, especially with the dancing. That can be kind of fun. Uh, it's interesting to see, but I am obliged to go show my face. Yes, sir. Uh, Zen Buddhism is becoming very popular in the States. How close does it reflect Japanese Zen Buddhism? Okay, Zen Buddhism is becoming very popular in the West. How closely does it resemble Japanese Buddhism? It's very, very different. It also has a lot of basis in theology or, or studying, reading books, exchanging opinions, and so on. In the monastery where I trained in, nobody had time for books. We didn't have time to read books, and very few of the monks uh, engaged in what might be, recall, might be called religious conversations. We were too tired. And uh, that sort of dialogue, religious dialogue or intellectual activity is not emphasized in the monastery. In fact, it is, in large part, rejected. Piety has no place in a Zen monastery. Zen monasteries are based on a feudalistic system that goes back at least a thousand years. It's a very, in, in Japan, it's very military as well. Military feudalistic system, which makes it so hard for Westerners to tolerate. It's very hard for me to tolerate. I do, but uh, I, I'm used to it to a certain extent. I learn how to, what can I say, just to, I'm not, it's not going to change and I'm not going to change it. So I don't really see myself as Mr. Blackship coming in to open up the Buddhist market or to change it in any way. Western activity in a way, Zen activity in a, in a way, very similar to the way Zen developed in China where people were very much on their own and set up their own practices or their own training centers, which later developed, as time went by, later developed into monasteries or established training centers. And the other thing that they have in, in the West is there is no money to be made from religion, at least from Zen, unless you're a writer or a lecturer. People that practice Zen in America, in a way, are a very pure form but they don't attain the, the, the training level is much easier. Now, according to each person's opinion, one is better or the other than the other. In fact, there are now Zen monasteries in Japan which are, are not official training centers, but they have sort of a, a compromise between the West and the East, uh, a fairly difficult training schedule, but 
none of this, certainly what is going on in the West, I've, I've been involved with a little bit, very little actually, of the training centers in the West, but none of them would compare to the, the difficulty, the level of difficulty or the level of seriousness, at least in terms of the physical schedule that goes on in Japan. There's a very brutal schedule going on here, and uh, it's more of a, a discipline here. It's a discipline there, but it's more of a, in, in there, by there I mean in the United States, it's more of a spiritual venture or adventure or seeking. Here it's just more of a, a very hardcore, brutal military dictatorship and that just happens to be dealing or based upon Zen. Yes? Could you describe some of that uh, uh, training? Uh, you mentioned it's difficult physically. Yes. So. Uh, let's see, a brief schedule or a brief definition perhaps of a typical day in the monastery. Usually, most Zen monasteries in Japan, the monks will get up at 3 or 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning and very little nourishment in the way of food. Monks are always hungry. I remember that. And in the winter, monks are always cold. Uh, my worst memories of the monastery are being brutally cold and colder than I thought it was possible for a human being to endure, actually. No heat, no hot water, no heat sources, no privacy, uh, no free time, uh, a diet that never changes, which is basically for breakfast is rice gruel, for, for lunch it's uh, rice and miso soup, bean paste or bean curd soup. Same thing for dinner. Dinner is leftovers from lunch. And the breakfast is just the boiled rice that is left over from dinner. Of course, you don't have time to dine, shall I say. Usually, you wolf it down as fast as you can. All pleasure is sucked out of life. And that includes dining or lounging or whatever people do. The, everything that could possibly be enjoyed is, is taken out of life in a Zen monastery. No privacy, no free time. No time, barely time to eat your food. Uh, it's all based upon working on your koan or meditation. And that can be, they're very hard work schedules as well, but, and some chanting, but that's considered just an extension of meditation. The entire focus is based upon meditation. The work schedule? Work schedule would be uh, working in gardens and and vegetable gardens, keeping the temple grounds clean, and also all buildings are wiped clean at least twice a day. I mean thoroughly wiped clean, at an incredibly fast pace. Everything is like clockwork, and it's a very fast clock you're operating on, and a very old clock, it goes back a thousand years, and a very mean clock. Very few foreigners survive in, in the Japanese monasteries. What is your goal and objective for this regimen? Your own salvation, your own enlightenment, or are you doing this for others, or what? And then you said there's no feeling or belief in afterlife. Why would a group of people or anyone do this? Why do people do this? Well, in Japan now, since the Meiji Restoration, people now are basically forced to do it, 90 to 95 percent of them. If your father is a priest then, and you are the eldest son, it is your duty to take over his position. If the eldest son rejects that, and there is a younger son, then the next son is obliged to take over the family enterprise. Family enterprise being the temple. That has historically been in Japan the, for almost any occupation, and nowadays, since about 150 years ago, they, when priests, Zen priests were allowed to start getting married, they, the eldest son, it was the duty of the eldest son to take over the family temple. Therefore, most people, most Japanese people in Zen monasteries, or even in other monasteries of other sects, are not there voluntarily. I'd say 95% of them do not want to be there. 
They are merely doing that merely to take over the family business. It is not a personal choice. They are merely holding their breath till the day <clears throat> when they will be allowed to leave the monastery. But you're using family business. Is this a source of income for the extended family? Yes. Temples, most temples in Japan now are inherited. It's not that people voluntarily go out for training. Uh, very few, maybe somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of Japanese people fall in the category of <clears throat> such as myself, where I voluntarily went, took this choice. And, and after going through a certain period of training, then took over a temple. Usually the eldest son takes over the, the family temple. It is a hereditary process now, which of course means that sincerity levels, of course, have declined with this. But it is also a very stable system and Japanese are very fond of stability. So they are willing, generally speaking, they are willing to to <clears throat> trade religious, genuine religious sentiment for stability. That has been the trade-off. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is there any function for women in Shintoism or Buddhism? Oh, certainly. You will see. Now, I'm not sure. I don't believe women, generally, they can't attain as high a status officially. But for, in the Shinto, I'm not sure. But a lot of women go through training there. And I don't believe they can, be, can become, say, a high priestess. But they can at least become a priest or a priestess. In Buddhism, yes, they can become nuns, they can head temples, and although they do not have the, uh, they do not ha officially have the status that, that male priests do, in a sense, in a social sense, they have more status, because women do not inherit temples, generally speaking. So any nun that you see, they stand out more, and everybody generally understands that they are more sincere. They're not merely carrying on their father's business. And while they may not have the official titles that are, say, as high-ranking as uh, male priests and so on, they have at least that much respect, social respect, given to them. And also, they can't get married. Other priests, male priests can get married, nuns officially cannot. However, I have seen cases where they do. And in a way, they're just considered, uh, in this case, there were no sons to take over the family temple, but there was a daughter, and so she took over the temple, or inherited the temple, and the congregation, if you can call it that, or the temple members, generally don't have any problems with this. And it is her job to produce the next priest. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what is the status of uh, the wives of priests? Uh, priests? Very frightening question. <laughs> what is the status of wives of Buddhist priests? This is a real minefield, if ever there was one. Officially, they have no uh, official role. However, in Japan, the wife is, of course, the male is the titular household, head of the household, but the wife really rules the roost. And there are many conflicts now with, with say, wives. When I think of wives, I think of uh, female instinct, which is to turn any, is to make a nest. While there are a lot of conflicts with a wife who is living in a temple who makes that her nest, her own private residence. Which means that any, any, mo most priests now are married, and if you go visit that priest, there is very likely that you cannot spend the night because there's a wife there and maybe a family. Wives are not very happy to have guests coming and staying. In the olden days in Japan, anybody could go, in theory and a lot in practice, people traveled around a lot and stayed in temples, and there were open religious institutions. With 
temple wives, temples begin to very much resemble just a house, just like any other, in which case you can go visit people, but you just generally don't spend the night or nights on end or weeks or months. This is what this was common activity in temples when they were first built. And wives hide in not they are in the shadow of the robe of the abbot or the chief priest, but that is where they operate best. Pretty frightening activity sometimes. I mean if you cross the wife, if you upset the priest or if you cross the priest you know, we're guys, and so it's like, yeah, okay. But if you upset a wife, you're in big trouble. What? I don't know what to say. It's, I've seen some amazing cases, and the first thing is don't upset the wife. <laughs> yes, sir? Is the ship equivalent to Gaiji, and would you care to comment on any stigma that you might carry? Is the black ship equivalent to Gaijin, and comment on, on any... Stigma. Oh, stigma that I might have. Black you ship. Okay. Okay. Black ship equivalent to Gaijin. Actually, the black ship is more of a Gaijin Godzilla. Oh, Gaijin is a foreigner. So, you know, Yankee boy. I get that occasionally. But, uh, yeah, I'm talking Godzilla here. And still, to this day, I, I can't believe that there are no other foreigners that have become abbots. I find that amazing. This is 1998. And I think that hundreds of people, I'm sure, that have never met me talk about me, I'm sure. My name has been listed in, in publications. and. And so it's like, well, here comes the black ship. I'm not officially the chief priest yet, but that's probably going to happen. It is. There are many documentaries that show uh, how foreigners are rejected. Yes. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of foreigner rejection in this country. In my case, yes, I've had some rejection, but you know, on a personal level, it's actually been to my, in a way, to my advantage. Because I'm one of a kind in this country to date, this in a way has made things easier. There has been some uh, problems, I suppose, but it's when I took this step to to get my own temple, I knew that there would be problems, and I have been surprised that there are not more problems. I've been surprised at how cooperative and how receptive the Japanese have been. This is, my story is not a story of, oh gee, they don't like me, oh gee, these people are so prejudiced, oh gee, my life is so hard, but uh, no, they've been very receptive, and for the example, the people that, that would say work against me as a foreigner, that's not something they would generally organize to do, or uh, there's not been, as far as I know, any particular movement. Basically, as the first foreigner, I am much more under the spotlight than other people would be. There have been, of course, more concessions, and one way that I've been able to pull this off is that I have been in and out of this country since I was 19 years old. I came here at a very young age, I'm 42 now, and I established this relationship with these Japanese people as family members, not as friends, not so much as colleagues. These people quickly became my family. It was never my goal until the age of 38 to take over a temple. This was something I decided when I was 38 years old. Now, my Zen training was not to take over a temple, not to become a priest. I was merely interested in Zen. I did that a long time ago. And I, although I've only been in, in and out of Japan for 12 years, I have been in constant contact with the people even when I was not in this country. Christmas cards, letters, occasional phone calls. I've bonded very strongly with the people in my immediate circle and one thing, in, in terms of the most obvious prejudice was, or, yeah, I guess one might say prejudice, when I first mentioned to them, I would like to have my own temple now, they were mortified. They were mortified. And this was not even my idea. Somebody else, I, I never even thought of it. I never even thought of this. Other priests, 
invited me. In particular, one other priest wanted me to take over a temple in his temple complex. He had a larger temple, there were several empty temples below him. He had a very intelligent, I might say visionary priest, this fellow. It was his idea. I never thought of it. I never thought it was possible. He said, he was, invited me several times and I said, what do you mean, take over one of your temples? I, the, the idea had not even occurred to me. And uh, he said, yeah, well, we, we, you've spent the minimum time in the monastery. You can get your license if you apply and you can do all that stuff and we'll give you your own temple. Well, um, that it took me a while to accept that, and then when I thought about it, I thought that would be a great idea. I like living in temples. I do not really define myself as a Buddhist or even a Zen Buddhist, but I like temple life. I like living in temples, particularly in mountain temples. Great atmosphere. I like the, I like that lifestyle. So when I decided that is what I wanted to do, I thought about it for a while. Then I mentioned that to to people I was had been involved with for nearly, actually for 20 years. They were mortified. They were mortified. That I found, that in a way, that kind of hurt my feelings. And, uh, but I can understand that they hadn't thought of that either. This is something nobody ever thought of. Nobody ever thought of doing this. And when I first mentioned it, it's a very interesting um, process, this, or series of incidents. Every one of them were mortified, and generally with the Japanese you can't see what they're thinking, but when I brought this up, it was very obvious on their face. It's like, mm, do you want to do what? And uh, very actively against it in the beginning. So I'm no, why don't I tell you what, we'll help you out and maybe you go open up a temple in, in, in America or somewhere. But I said, no, I don't really want to, I'm not a missionary kind of guy. I don't want to spread Buddhism. I have no interest in that. I just, I like this culture, and I want, if possible, my own temple here. What do you think? Well, everybody, I suppose a dozen people that I'd known for 20 years, they were all mortified. And I found that, that, like I said, that kind of hurt my feelings. Felt a little bit betrayed. But then, when they all got used to this, things suddenly, and they could see the potential of, oh, this guy does it, he's going to be famous. Well, everybody has a little bit of whatever, so it's like, then there began a sudden about phase and an active recruiting phase that began. It's like, oh, come and join my temple complex. I'll give you one of my temples. I'll give you this temple. Why don't you become officially in my organization? It was a uh, actually, it was a rather interesting then, well, I was vindicated, at least personally, one might say, when they could grasp the larger picture of what was actually going to happen. So, in that sense, then it suddenly began to work to my advantage. I still had to go through all the hoops, and I'm still going through that, but, yes, anybody, and when I finally chose a Basically, I chose the first people that supported me from day one, which was a natural choice. I had to choose them. Uh, even in Zen, there's a very rigid hierarchy, very defined pyramid, and I had to choose a pyramid that I was going to reside in. And so I chose, the, of course, the original pyramid, which was, of course, a very difficult group or pyramid to step into, but they've been with me since day one. And, and so... So from that point on, they've been more helpful, I would say. Yes, ma'am. Is there only one priest per temple, or do you have other priests working in your temple, or...? So, the question is, how many priests per temple? That depends on the temple. In my case, I live alone. Smaller temples are frequently occupied by one priest, maybe his wife and family. Larger temples... Uh, Generally, there's only one chief priest and maybe other priests, but, for example, in any of these temples around here, there are several priests. And usually they're, say, running the administrative offices. If you get into larger monastery complexes, well, the people that do the administration, uh, they're generally all priests of that certain sect. A typical temple has only one priest and that is the chief priest. As they become larger, there are more duties required, and other people fill those roles. Yes, sir. Um, 
what is the role of the congregationalist or the lay person and how do you administer to them? Okay, so the question is about congregations. How do we priests deal with a congregation? Actually, the, in any sect, almost any sect, I can only think of one, which is almost a, uh, which is a very ground movement sect, ground level movement. Basically, we do not have Sunday services. We generally do not give speeches or sermons of any kind. <clears throat> there is, in most sects, there is no organized group like we think of in the West, like there's a church community and things. Generally, in, in Zen and in other sects of Buddhism as well, it's purely ceremonial. During certain times of the year, there are certain ceremonies that go on, and if people are interested, they come and participate in the ceremony, usually as observers. Usually no speech, no sermon, no speaking during these. Maybe they will have a guest speaker, uh, maybe a professor or a Buddhist scholar come in and talk about something, but nothing resembling a sermon, nothing resembling anybody quoting from scripture, nothing resembling anybody telling you how you should live, how you should be a good person, how you should believe in our church and further our cause and expand our membership. I've never seen that. Uh, and as a purely ceremonial basis, the final, the bottom line come, works down to funerals. People join temples because in the future they want to have a Buddhist funeral and usually they have become, their families have become members of a certain temple generations before. So they don't change temples. They don't think, okay, well I like this priest over here, so I'm going to move my, my religious activities over to this guy. No. Usually they inherit their family cemetery plots in a certain temple and that is the way where they continue. And it's only for memorial services and basically ceremonies. It's not for religious consultation. There's very little of that. It's, and they don't even, in many cases, people don't even know hardly anything about the priest at the temple they are a member of. They generally don't change membership. It's just a function, a service that is provided when people die. Very simple. Yes, ma'am, in the back. This is kind of redundant, but I'm still trying to get my mind around it. Um, in the U.S., we study sittings of uh, and so on for our personal interests. Yes. Everything you described sounds like the Japanese would only study if they were planning to become a priest and take over a temple. That is something. No, you've got it. Japanese, yes. In the West, like I said, for religion we are more internally motivated. If we want to learn about Zen in the West, we practice Zen, uh, you know, we read the usual books, and maybe some unusual books, and we maybe go to a Zen center and practice Zazen entirely voluntary basis. Here, usually the priests, most monks, <coughs> in most sects, not just Zen, don't want to be there. Uh, if they had a, a way of getting around it, they would. They are not there voluntarily. I would say straight across the board for all Buddhist monasteries in Japan, perhaps only 5% are there of their own volition. 95% are serving time to get their degree or their license or their minimum requirements so they can fulfill their duty that is obliged, that society has obliged them to do. They are merely filling out their role. Yes, sir. Uh, since most of your uh, activities are around death, could you briefly outline the uh, ceremonies, the funerals? Yes. Since the funeral ceremony is actually very simple, no speeches. Uh, usually when somebody dies, the first thing is that they will call the temple and, and the priest has to, the chief priest or anybody, if the pre chief priest can't do it, this, and the second priest in charge goes to the 
mortuary and says a uh, chants a few prayers right there on the spot. And then usually the next night or the night after they will have a, a wake. If it's in a temple, and usually funerals actually are a very happy event in this country. If it's an older person. If it's a younger person, then it's a very unpleasant event. If it's an older person, say older than 70, then it's virtually a party. I think they do the same in Ireland, I've heard, uh, where they have wakes where people stay up all night and have a good old time getting plastered. And particularly for someone, say, uh, over 80 years old, well, it's a very, very happy event. It's literally a party. And after that, say, if it's somebody in their 50s, well, okay, uh, younger person, then you'll see people actually crying in a funeral. It's a sad event. And generally, the funerals I have assisted in, it is a, generally a family member, a very somber event. Uh, not as, say, traumatic as a Christian funeral. Unless it's a younger person. Then you know, occasionally you'll have people having oh, what emotional difficulty with with what's happened. But older persons, it's actually a very pleasant experience to participate in a funeral. And all we do is chant. Well, we have a few instruments, gongs and bells that we hit at certain times. But it's about a 40-minute ceremony, no speeches, no sermons, no eulogizing, no speaking of the person. Uh, and then after that, the person is taken to to be cremated, and the priest goes for that as well, chants sutras during that. And then a week later, they have a number memorial service, and a month later, a month a month after the anniversary, and then either every month or once a year, depending on the family. I've been, I think I've done about a dozen funerals, and they can be very nice affairs, especially the memorial services. Afterwards, in a way, because the entire family gets together, the entire extended family, as much as possible, gets together, and this is the only time they will do so. In a way, it's kind of like our Thanksgiving. And it is a very nice feeling. I really enjoy doing, especially the memorial services. Not so much the funeral, but the funerals are interesting, but the memorial service has has the warmest feeling of all the services that I would ever participate in. It's the only time you see an extended Japanese family together with relatives and uncles and things like that. They're, usually everybody's too busy to get together. In this case, that is in a way their Thanksgiving and it is a very nice mood. And also, they occasionally I do uh, these in my own temple. Uh, it's tradition in the neighborhood where if somebody dies, even from another temple, before they have the official ceremony, they go to all the local temples. There are five of us, I'm one of them, and have a 10 or 15 minute ceremony. And I remember the first one I did, in this case was, uh, I was this was the first memorial service I had ever done on my own. And actually, I think, yes. Um, so I was rather nervous, how would these people think? And I was relatively new to the neighborhood. Many of these people had never seen me before. Funeral, of course, is a very private affair. So they collected in front of my temple, and I opened up the door, dressed very similarly as I am today, and I was, of course, very nervous. And uh, it was funny because uh, the first, of course, they were kind of surprised. They looked just, I opened up the, the gates to the main hall, and they just, they knew it was a foreigner, but they just looked at me like, you know, well, what's, What's this? And uh, <clears throat> in terms of the, say, the, the levity that goes on in a funeral or the warm family feeling, one of the first things that anybody said, it was some guy who was probably a little bit drunk, which is par for the course, and, uh, you know, as, as a funeral, as a celebration. And he looked at me and he said, my God, you don't think he's going to do this in English, do you? <laughs> and of course, everybody, a perfect icebreaker, everybody laughed. And uh, including me, it became much easier after that. In fact, uh, my immediate response was, well, if you want it done in English, it's going to cost you double. <laughs> it was almost, I mean, I said that just without thinking. Unfortunately, they laughed. I was thinking it was kind of a dangerous thing to say. But uh, they enjoyed it, and that is generally funerals in Japan are very happy affairs. I am glad, and I enjoy being part of them. Is there, yes, they're not mourning. 
Yeah. No, they're not really in mourning, it's in celebration. Yeah. I think the French have a great saying for it, the end of the toothache. <laughs> That's the end of the toothache. Yes, sir. I was going to ask you, have you seen the Japanese movie called The Funeral? Yes, I have. That was a wonderful film. I can't, was that? Uh, it was one of the funniest films I've ever seen. Yes. Yes, I've seen that film twice. I can't. I, that was done by one of the major Japanese directors. Yeah. And uh, I would recommend that film to anybody. And was, it's it very, true? was it a good representation? Yes. Wow. A very good representation. It's actually a very funny world that we live in. It is. And uh, it has its moments of levity. Yes, that was a very accurate film, in fact. A second question. Uh, I don't quite get the drift of how you earn a living uh, if you're just dependent on people giving you money for funerals. In my case, uh, since I have no congregation yet, I'm just the assistant abbot, maybe later uh, I will uh, be able to work on um, uh, something that might be referred to as a congregation, but now I don't. I am mostly dependent upon my own work. I teach English part-time, I do other things part-time. Funerals I do occasionally, I do other things. Uh, I have about, really, I think about seven or eight sources of income. And funerals pay very well. It's usually, even to assist, it's over a thousand dollars. And, but I very seldom do that. And uh, I think when they make me abbot, I will become, perhaps, do more of those. But until then, I am one of the poorest, I am the poorest priest that I know. <laughs> I could, yeah, most of them have a monthly income that is far more than my annual income. So what would that be from? Uh, that would be from their congregation. A typical, there's really no such thing as a typical size temple, but a lot of the temples that I know, Zen temples, probably the same with others, have um, a congregation, they're counted by houses. An entire family is a member, this is where their funeral plots are, this is where they're going to be buried. Uh, a good sized temple has 250 houses that are members, and so that's a full time job for the priest to go around doing memorial services. They probably do it five days a week. And that's one source of their income. They can probably count on, I don't know, an average of 10 to 20 funerals a year, and lots of donations, and a very good sized income. Some temples with larger property ownings have get rents or le um, monies from leases and things like that. So it could be any number of, of incomes. Yes, ma'am. Who, uh, who organizes the Dante? Anybody is free to organize their own Zazen centers. I've been, that has, people have asked me occasionally if I would, uh, if I'm interested in doing or leading Zazen meetings. And in my case, my temple is very much out of the way. It's way up uh, on the mountain side, very difficult to get to. And I just tell people, yeah, if you're interested in doing Zazen, come on over, I'll do it to your schedule. And other temples, but you know, that's, more difficult for people to do. If my temple were centrally located near a train station where people could go to and from work, or, you know, after work drop by for a certain night, those kind of temples uh, attract more of a uh, regular sitting group. What is Zazen? Zazen is um, Zen meditation. Yes, ma'am, way in the back. Uh, when you become a monk, is this a lifetime commitment? Not for everybody, and it's not required to be a commitment, but frequently it is. I plan on being in my temple until I die, or until they fire me. Very hard to fire a priest. You really have to do something outrageous. And, um, but in my personal case, and in most cases, yes, it takes so much to become a priest. There is nowhere... Uh, there's nowhere written in anything that if you do the training then you're supposed to go on and continue. But generally people do, just because to get through the monastic training in the first place, frequently you're willing to go the whole nine yards. And is there a monastery life like it would be in a Catholic? Uh, in the Zen tradition, that's where we do our training. 
and there are, I think, three main sects, the Zen and Shingon and Tendai. These are the three main sects in Japan that have a monastic tradition. The other ten sects do not have a monastic tradition. And a monastic tradition, usually for any of the sects, requires at least a minimum training period of one year in the monastery. There are other things, uh, a, a degree counts towards the total resume uh, that puts you up in the ladder. There are very different levels, 12 different levels in the Zen world, 12 different statuses, the top three being for Zen masters. Yes, ma'am. Change as your status advances. How was that? How are you addressed? And does that change as your status advances? How am I addressed? Uh, the general, yeah, it can. The, now I would be referred to as an osho, which is a general term for priest. Uh, specifically, more specifically, which most people don't know that much about, is uh, I would be considered now a fukuju shoku, which would be assistant abbot. And when you become the abbot, then it's a, it's also another major step up because you are given responsibility for a temple. It doesn't matter what the size of the temple is, it's still a major promotion. And to become abbot or the chief priest, yes, that is considered a major step up. And that matters to a lot of people. And people uh, frequently ask me, gee, well, especially when they first meet me, well, what should I call you? Uh, and I just say, well, my first name is Martin. I mean, it's worked pretty well up till now. So, now I basically get titles kind of embarrass me. Yes, sir? Uh, could you share with us the sound of your chanting? Somewhere along the line? Could I share with you the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> Was that the question? No? No, chanting. chanting. Oh, chanting. chanting. Would you like to hear some chanting? Yes. yes. That's an easier question. First of all, I'm not allowed to tell you the answer to the sound of one hand clapping. I know that. I didn't ask that. Good. Uh, chanting. <clears throat> yeah, usually it has some other uh, a bell and a little drum they pound. But also the chanting, generally even priests don't even know what we're chanting. It's Chinese characters that were translated from Sanskrit. The original meaning is not nearly as important as the act or the mood that one has while chanting. So will I chant? Uh, I'm trying to think of a simple one. I just have to interrupt it. It's the basic sutra, the Hanyashinyo. Maga. say a Gregorian chant, not as attractive, but it becomes a meditative state in itself. I do not think about the meaning. Most priests do not think about the meaning. It's basically a song. And in the beginning, I, I can say that I honestly hated chanting. I hated Japanese ceremonies. I did not come to this country when I was 19 years old to learn how to perform ceremonies. That was not my religious quest here. Uh, but later, as I grew older, it, didn't bother me that much. And now it's just, uh, well, ceremonies don't bother me so much anymore. Yes, sir. Uh, another lecture to explain this, the, uh, the rulers here did, invited Buddhism in for reasons of state. Yes. Um, well, I'd be interested to know uh, what did they have in mind that Buddhism could contribute to the running of the state, and secondly, can you explain the history of uh, this certification process? Uh, how did that come about? Okay, the first question is, uh, actually it wasn't so much invited in as that it was allowed in. Any of these 13 sects brought in from China, usually 
uh, there was some charismatic figure or some some fellow who brought it over. Actually, several people would bring over, but say any particular new sect would be brought in, and as soon as possible, they would re want the support of the government. If you had the support of the government, then you were in. If you did not have the support of the government, you were not in. So one by one, each of these sects gained favor with different emperors or different governments, and generally they were brought in or approved of and were dedicated to the safety and security and preservation of the nation or the state. At that time, of course, they didn't have nations, but uh, even here, this is why these larger buildings were, were built in capitals. They, the priests put in charge were in charge of prayers for the state on the government of that time. And each of these 13, at one time or another, won a certain amount of approval. And once they got state backing, they got state funds, and then they flourished without any of those. And of course, with each new one that came in, each was, of course, oppressed by the others that were already in. And over the centuries, well, all 13 of the major sects in China originally made it here. So that's how they were brought in, not exactly invited, but accepted, and if they were embraced by the powers that be, then they succeeded. It takes a lot of money to build one of these things like Todaiji, and that required, I mean, that's almost like, say, building a pyramid. They were very expensive, and it took a lot of energy and time, and only a government or a ruling military class could do it, or could afford it. That's how they got sponsorship. And every new sect that came in from Japan, the first thing they sought was sponsorship. They didn't try to work so much among the younger or the people because there wasn't much future in that. Once you got that big sponsor, then you had everything, or everything followed. And what was the second part of the question? Uh, what did the government, why did the government think it was uh, of, of, of interest to them? Now, they mentioned at one point that they were, the uh, temples were used for vital uh, statistics. Yes. They were key registering births and deaths. Yes. But what else did the government think they would get out of having these sects here? Uh, aside from the religious protection, uh, or somebody officially saying prayers for them on protecting the state, they also got, temples also brought a writing system, brought literature, a new system of thought, which was revolutionary at the time, and uh, new, new education, new cultures, new way of, of, new Japanese, which are now standard traditional Japanese arts, for example, tea, green tea was brought in from China, calligraphy, all the calligraphy arts brought in directly from China, the writing system, lock, stock, and barrel, and before that, there was no writing system in Japan. Before they brought in Chinese characters, there was a spoken language, but no written language. And so they brought in basically education and culture in so many different ways. Um, also, temples were the original colleges, the original colleges, original learning centers, original hospitals, original town centers in every way that one could think. So they brought a lot, actually, and when a government was, was building itself, they, this is how the temple served. We still have time for another one? Almost. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, in uh, Christianity, the minister does a lot of counseling to emotionally upset parishioners. Yes. Is that done at all in Buddhism or Shintoism? Or if not, where did the Japanese get that? Um, so the question is. Um, do we deal with counseling or do counseling with Japanese people? Very, very little. Japanese do not have much counseling or therapy of any kind in um, um, analysis of any kind in this country. It's only recently is are there having to be any sort of uh, concern for that. Of course, the traditional mentality, I mean, things happen to Japanese that upset them and disturb their equilibrium and but generally they de they tough it out and it's endurance is a requirement in this culture perseverance and in the west we deal with our problems by talking about them 
either to the minister or a psychiatrist or psychologist or analyst or minister or something in Japan, they don't do that. Most parts of Asia, they don't do that. They don't resolve the problem by speaking about it to somebody, and especially an official person, let alone somebody that you would pay. Occasionally, I get people ask or that, that have problems, but that's very unusual, and it's usually younger people, and they come to me, among other reasons, because I'm a foreigner, but they usually would not go to a Japanese priest. Generally, I mean, that's certainly available. A person can do that, but generally, they don't. The Japanese are very good at, at uh, suppressing the bad things that happen to them. They're not what you would call complainers or... or uh,